This video will serve as a place of a morning review session I normally do before a test. So I'm going to run through each learning target just like normal and work out the math behind me. So first learning target is I can distinguish between heat and temperature. Heat, if you remember, is total energy, kinetic plus potential of the system, where temperature is just kinetic energy. So temperature is that measure of average kinetic energy, meaning if temperature is changing, that means kinetic energy is changing. But you can have a scenario where heat changes and temperature doesn't change, and that occurs when you have a potential energy change. So potential energy is really um, having to do with the position and arrangement of the bonds within a, a compound. So when you break and make new bonds, that, that is when your potential energy changes. Okay? Um, and then when it comes to heat and energy, the energy is always going to flow from hot kinetic things to cold kinetic things. And it's going to flow until you get to an equal temperature. So in some ways, that potential energy I often think about is not a measurement that we know. We can measure the change in potential energy, oftentimes because of how temperature is affected by potential energy changes. But um, for example, if I had like, you know, a hot metal and I put it in cold water and they both end up at the same temperature, I wouldn't necessarily know anything about the total energy of each system. I could know how much energy was lost by the metal. I could know how much energy was gained by the water. I could know what final temperature they were at, um, but that would be about it. So energy flows from hot to cold. Um, energy lost by one is gained by the other, which is fundamental for calorimetry. Um, and they do that until temperatures are equal. So the next one is I can distinguish between endothermic and exothermic. And there are lots of different ways to be able to determine endo and exothermic. Okay. So one question about endo and exothermic would simply be where to place the energy within a thermochemical equation. So in a scenario like this where I have A plus B making C plus D, if I told you the heat of the reaction for that reaction was negative 17, I could then potentially ask you to rewrite this as a thermochemical equation. That would just mean uh, having a reaction including the heat. Since this is negative, that means this is an exothermic reaction and exothermic heats are always added on the product side. So this negative sign, when you have a heat uh, not within a chemical reaction, that negative sign is there to indicate that energy was released or came out or is exothermic. Once you place it as part of the reaction as a product, we don't need that negative sign anymore because the location tells us out, right? Everything on the product side was released or given off or exothermic. So the placement is the sign in that case. Okay? If instead the heat of reaction was positive, I took in 17, 17 kilojoules, that means this is endothermic. And for endothermic, the heat of the reaction is always written on the reactant side with units if you can fit them. So that's one way we can talk about endo and exothermic is as a placement of where we put the heat. Um, another thing we can talk about for endo and exo is temp change, okay? So in a scenario, and the most important thing for this is to differentiate the system from the surroundings. So in a scenario where I have a exothermic chemical reaction happening, right? So for my system, if this is exothermic, that means I'm going to have energy being released as negative Q, so energy flowing out. And that means the surroundings is going to gain Q, which means it's going to get hotter. So the reason why we say exothermic reactions generally, you know, we think of exothermic as hotter. That's because exothermic is releasing energy to the surroundings and we're actually in the surroundings feeling the heat. Okay, so it's not that an exothermic reaction itself gets hot, but it produces energy into the surroundings which get hot. Okay. If we reverse this and instead the system is an endothermic process, so it is taking heat in, that heat is coming from the surroundings, right? So my reaction is sucking that heat in to the bonds. Um, and so the surroundings that are getting colder because we're feeling the absence of heat as the heat goes into the reaction. So another way to think about endo and exo is by temperature change. So that's one way. So placement on reaction, temperature change, sign, which is actually the third learning target up here. I can uh, apply the proper sign convention. So exothermic is always negative. Endothermic is always positive. Um, 
and that's probably it. Another way to deal with endo and exo are with energy diagrams, which I have up here. So we start energy somewhere, and if we compare where we start to where we end, we can see if we're endo or exo. So for the first diagram, because we start higher and end lower, from start to finish I have less energy, which means it's exothermic, energy is given out. In the second one, because I end with higher energy than where I began, that was energy going in, so that would be endothermic. The other question I've asked about frequently with endo and exo is which side of the reaction do the chemical compounds have more potential energy? Essentially, in an exothermic process, this triangle represents kinetic energy. This is just free energy that was given off, oftentimes absorbed by the surroundings in order to have them heat up, change temperature. Um, but what this means is in an exothermic process, the reactants have more potential. And that's because um, essentially in a chemical reaction, energy on the reactant side and the product side is the same. So the energy right now in A and B on this side has to be represented by C and D and an extra heat. Okay, so this is all energy that C and D lost in its potential and is now available to do other things. If the heat is on the product side, the reactants have more potential. And if the heat is on the reactant side, the products have more potential. So essentially, the side that doesn't have the heat symbol is the side that has more potential. Now we're getting into math. So I can calculate the energy change for any thermochemical reaction if the heat of reaction is known. Um, I guess I've never written a second learning target because the math that fits under here is if the reaction is known or unknown. Okay, so I got two different examples. For the first one, I give you a heat of reaction. So if you look at the chemical reaction, the 2,200, the 2, 2,219 kilojoules is up there. So if I want to know how much energy is transferred when I produced 42.5 grams of carbon dioxide, that's straight up stoic. I can go gram to mole and mole the energy given the fact that I have an energy to mole relationship in my equation. Okay, so I'm going to start out. Uh, with a thing I'm not solving for, right? If I started with energy, I can't get to energy. So I'm going to start with grams, and I'm going to go gram to mole using molar mass, and then I can go mole to energy given the thermochemical equation. That says kilojoules. Everyone can tell. Okay. So gram to mole is molar mass, which is this, 44.009 per 1. And then if I look at my balanced chemical equation, my heat is on the product side, so it's negative 2219. And I'm converting right now carbon dioxide, right? This is carbon dioxide. So the energy to mole relationship given the balanced chemical equation is that 2219 is released per three moles of carbon dioxide. So that is the equation, 2219 per three. That's it. I ended with heat, so I would just stick that in my calculator, and I get negative 714, and the final label for that is just kilojoules, since all of my units canceled all the way through. The second problem up here looks very similar to the first one, in that I have a gram amount, and I have an energy amount. The difference is that energy amount is not considered a heat of reaction. So a heat of reaction is the amount of energy per the written reaction. So for the top one, it's per one mole of that hydrocarbon and per five mole of oxygen and per three mole of carbon dioxide and per four mole of water. For the second one, the negative 78.9 is not per heat of reaction. It's not per three moles of iron or two moles of oxygen or one mole of iron oxide. It's per 11.8 grams of iron. So when 11.8 grams of iron is reacted, that is the specific amount of energy that's released, okay? So it wants me to solve for heat of reaction in this bottom problem. In order to solve for heat of reaction, I need an energy amount and I need a mole amount. And if I divide them by each other and then multiply by the coefficient, that's the final answer. The problem gives you a heat amount, right? I have a negative 78.9, so that part's done. I don't have a mole amount, I have a gram amount, but luckily we have fantastic molar mass that allows me to get from grams to moles of any compound I want at any time, given an awesome periodic table. So that's for iron, that's the molar mass for iron, so I get this many moles. Okay. So all I do to solve it then is I go energy 
per mole I just solved for, 0.211. And that gives me my ratio, but the problem is I want a heat of reaction. So the last thing you have to do after you get your ratio is potentially multiply by the coefficient. And that is because I want my final answer to be the amount of energy per mole within the reaction. And since this particular equation was using iron, I have to be able to do it per three. If it had been oxygen, I'd multiply by two. If it had been iron oxide, I wouldn't multiply at all because it'd be per one. Okay, essentially when you do this ratio, it's n amount of energy per one mole. I gotta up it to make it three. So if I solve this guy right here, I end up getting negative 373. And the label for this one, opposed to the top one, is kilojoule per mole. I divided those two and I didn't cancel anything out. Okay, so it is energy per mole, and I usually put that reaction down there to remind myself that it's per mole of the coefficient. We also were working with temp change with Q because MC delta T. So number one, I can define specific heat capacity. That's the amount of energy to take one gram of anything and make it one degree hotter. Okay, so what specific heat capacity really means then is if it has a very large specific heat capacity, you need a lot of energy for every one gram of it to make it one degree hotter. So I often think of specific heat capacity as the resistance of temp change. So if you have a really big specific heat capacity, it means you need a lot of energy to change its temp per one gram. Okay, so that's why for water, for example, it just takes so long to boil it. If we tried to boil a material with a lower specific heat capacity, it would get there much faster, a right? lot less energy. Now, within um, that specific heat capacity and cubic sense delta T, you need to be able to answer some generic concept questions about cubic sense delta T, okay, which we've seen in different places. But I'll show you just quick usually how I solve these guys. I solve them based on the equation. I don't plug any numbers into them, though. So for the first one, if energy is, if the energy put in is the 1,500 joules, and all of them are getting that same energy, and the temp change is always the same, then the question is, how is the mass relating to C? Okay, so essentially Q is constant, T is constant. So I kind of just ignore those. And then I say to myself, okay, the question's asking how I can have the most mass possible, okay? And given the fact that Q has to be the same and T has to be the same, then if I want M to go up, I have to have C go down to make all the other variables the same, right? Because if I got something more and more and more massive and C was also getting bigger and bigger and bigger, then Q would go up because temp isn't changing. So in order to counterbalance M and C, essentially I put, you know, whatever arrow I'm asking about up and down and then the reverse is true. So the most massive thing is gonna have the smallest C, okay? Um, and then for the second one, I can do the same thing, Q equals MC delta T. Uh, Q, uh, Q is not changing again. Mass this time isn't changing. So it's saying uh, which substance will change temperature the least. So if I want temp to be tiny, what does that mean in relation to C? Well, if T goes down, C has to go up to keep everything else constant. So that's usually how I answer those questions, just mathematically based on the relationship within the equation. You can also think it through. I feel like that first one's hard to think through. The second one isn't though, right? If I don't want a temperature change, uh, if I don't want a substance to change temperature much, oh yeah, that's a big C because I want it to resist temp change, which is what specific heat capacity is. Then there's the math being able just to cube some delta T yourself through life. Okay, and this will probably show up on the multiple choice portion rather than the short answer of just being able to math this. Okay, uh, one point, <coughs> not super hard, uh, just plug all the variables in. So if I read through the equation and I know in my head Q equals MC delta T, I see that I'm given a Q, right? The iron releases 750, so that negative sign has to be a thing. And I'm given a mass, which is 150, and I will give you the C's so you won't need any kind of thermochemical reference table. And then I don't know the final temp, but I do know the initial temp, and that was 20. So you just algebra this 
for me, because I'm solving for one of the ones that has a subtraction, I'm going to divide the 150 over, divide the 0 .49, 0 0.449 over, and then deal with this last thing at the end. Now, one thing you can do conceptually to make sure whether your problem is right or wrong is to realize that um, for iron, for example, if I'm going to be releasing energy, you can look at that 20 degrees and ask yourself, is my energy or my temperature, sorry, going to go up or down if I release the heat? Well, if I'm releasing heat, that means I'm going to have less heat, which means the temperature should be smaller in the end. So when I map this appropriately, I end up with an answer of 8.86 degrees Celsius. And the temperature does go down because I released heat, right? I'm losing energy. Something else is going to gain energy. But if I'm losing energy, I'm going to get colder. Okay, guaranteed. Okay, then the very last topic for this guy is calorimetry, which is basically putting everything together. So, of course, this is going to show up on your short answer. Okay, this is putting together all the thermochemical stuff with all of the um, MC delta T stuff. Okay, so I have a reaction, uh, it's doing stuff, but it's within a calorimeter, and I say that uh, more specifically on your test, right? So you can draw a picture, I've asked you to draw a picture like every single time. Um, so I have some kind of reaction which has that 15 grams, and in the water on the outside, I have 135 grams. Uh, grams of water and the 4.18 is the C always. I have a temperature initial which is 12.8 and a temperature final which is 24.3. So that's all the information I have in this equation. First question I'm asking here is what is the energy change for water? Okay, given the fact of what you see. Now, you should be able to figure out again who's losing and who's gaining based on the information so far. Since the water is increasing in temperature, we know this is the situation. Energy is flowing out from the reaction into the surroundings, um, and the water is getting hotter. Therefore, the reaction is exothermic, right? The reaction is losing, and the water is gaining. Makes sense? Because it's combustion. So, uh, to start with the water, um, to do an energy change of water will always, 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 always be Q on C delta T, because the water will always be changing temp. I, so I don't might know my Q for water, because I don't know the amount of energy water gained, but I do know the M, and I know the C, and I know the change in temp, which is final 24.3 minus 12.8. Okay. So from that, that will tell me the amount of energy that water took in during this combustion of um, methanol. So uh, water took in, what, six? Four nine zero joules of energy given that MC delta T. Okay. Now, the most important thing is this component, which is where did the energy come from and what do we know now? So I know that if water took in, right, took in this 6,490 joules, and I know my reaction gave that out. Okay. So my reaction gave out negative 6490 joules, or to write it in kilojoules, because when I'm working with like a reaction, I'm usually working in kilojoules, it'd be 6.49 kilojoules. In the end of the test, this would be the question. Okay, given all the information, I'd say solve for the molar heat of reaction. In order to solve for the molar heat of reaction, you need to get the heat the reaction gave off by using the water, change it to kilojoules, change it to to um, change the sign, and then again, the molar heat of reaction will always be a kilojoule per mole amount. So I have my kilojoule amount now, I just need to get my mole amount of the reaction, right, not the water. So I'm going to use my methanol because that is the reaction part, um, molar mass because that's the thing. Sorry, you can't read that at all. The molar mass of methanol is 32. 0, 0.042 grams. Sure, that's a thing. Um, so the amount of moles of methanol is this, 468 mole. So that is what I end up putting under the heat because the heat of reaction is the amount of energy per mole for this particular reaction when I 
burned 15 grams, I released 6.49. So it's not per um, reaction right now. It's per this particular reaction. So to get up to molar heat, I take energy divided by mole, and then I multiply it by the coefficient to get to my ratio as per mole reaction. So the final answer for this guy then would be this. Just like that. That's it for the content for this video, or for this uh, unit. Uh, if you have questions, again, come to Zoom at any point. Uh, I am going to do Zoom today, sorry, uh, days, Wednesday, um, morning and afternoon. And then Thursday, some people said, like, well, what if we have some final questions? Um, I can't do an afternoon Zoom on Thursday, I don't think. If I can, it won't be till, like, 2. Um, but I will do the morning session at 9.45 if people have questions. Um, so that's it. You guys are doing amazing. I'm so proud of you. I hate this. Have I mentioned that? Um, my kids are great, though. I just miss being with you. Um, and teaching. I miss teaching. <laughs> uh, yeah. Have a good day.